This afternoon I would efficiently expound the 29th Psalm. And, and I've entitled the message, O oh, Worship the King. It's very much like the thoughts expressed in the 13th hymn of our hymnal by that title. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. O oh, gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. And the second verse of the hymn. O tell of his might, O sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. This is one of the greatest hymns in English, many people agree. And it is like the 29th Psalm in this respect. It is a call to worship the Lord, followed by a delineation of His attributes and ways. That is the straightforward message of the hymn and the psalm. Um, and Psalm 29 has a basic message which I would summarize in this way. Creation exists for God first and peripherally to Him. Uh, the Lord has made all things for Himself, Proverbs 16 says. Even the wicked for the day of evil. Um, creation, in other words, is theocentric. Romans 11.36 says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. And of course, we're part of the creation, each one of us. And so we can know for sure that our existence is secondary to God's existence. Ours is derived from His, and our existence is only justified by our usefulness to put God's glory on display, just like the rest of creation. Why the mountains? Why the oceans? Why the stars? And why human beings? It's all the same reason. Glory to the Creator. Glory to God. And actually, in God's eternal plan, it so works out that every single human being will redound to His praise in one way or another. Romans chapter 9, verses 22 and 3 explain. There it says, What if God willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath. That's a metaphorical reference to human beings. It's theologically referred to as the reprobate, reprobate as opposed to the elect. What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. That is, there are two kinds of people in the world, the elect and the reprobate. In the case of those whom God has chosen for salvation, the Lord eternally purposes to glorify Himself by pouring His mercy within them and upon them. They are vessels for mercy, and God's mercy will be seen to His praise in the elect. With respect to the reprobate, God has eternally purposed as well to glorify Himself in them, but in another way. By showing the power of His wrath in their ruin for their sins. And He will fill them like vessels with His wrath. And then, like never before, He will be praised for His glorious power and just wrath. 
So everyone in God's purpose will glorify God one way or another. That's why we exist. For His sake. You know, this justifies the old Protestant Reformation slogan. Soli Deo Gloria. All glory to God alone. And the difference between the righteous and the wicked on this score is that the righteous are altogether pleased that it should be so. There are people in this world whose heart leaps with joy at the prospect that God ultimately will have the glory over all his creation. And the most righteous people in the world are the most pleased with that prospect. They know by grace deep down that that is right and that is good. And and they are zealous to see God glorified above all. Amen? Amen. This is this is fundamental piety and virtue uh, with respect to the glory of God. We love God. We're zealous to see him glorified. I did a, uh, a phrase search. In my vast, and I'm not exaggerating, my vast electronic library of resources for the phrase, as long as God is glorified. And I got one hit. It was from the sermons of the Baptist preacher, C.H. Spurgeon. And let me read the paragraph in which that phrase appears in Spurgeon's sermons. Spurgeon said, The best man in the church is the man who is willing to be a doormat for all to wipe their boots on. The brother who does not mind what happens to him at all, so long as God is glorified. I have heard brethren say, well, but you must stand up for your dignity. I lost mine a long time ago, and I never thought it was worthwhile to look for it. (laughs) So this this is humorous. But it expresses a biblical perspective that the glory of God, brethren, is the only thing ultimately that matters. And the sooner we recognize that and submit to it in our spirits, the better off we will be. When when you read, when you hear Spurgeon saying this, does your heart say amen in response? It doesn't matter what people think of me. So long as God is glorified. Spurgeon testified that was his spirit. I wonder how well it describes ours. The Lord be with us and help us to be humbly zealous for his glory. Well, our object of special focus is out of the Bible to the, this, this afternoon is Psalm 29. I would like to read it in your hearing. May I ask the congregation please to stand out of reverence for God's Word. Psalm 29, a psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forests. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Amen? Amen. 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 Please be seated.
So I would teach the content of the psalm under four headings. First, a call to worship the Sovereign Lord in verses 1 and 2. Then three subsections. The first dealing with the Lord's majestic power, verses 3 to 9. Then the Lord's majestic position in verse 10. And finally, the Lord's majestic purpose in verse 11. So it's all about the majesty of the Lord in his power, position, and purpose. And this should stimulate us to praise him. So let's begin then with the first part, the call to worship the sovereign Lord in verses 1 and 2. The very old verse divisions really uh, need to be uh, overlooked uh, for uh, a more careful consideration of the Hebrew poetic structure of this part that's labeled one and two. Actually, there are four lines of Hebrew poetry here, and it's not hard to discern them in the first two verses. Uh, it's really quite easy because each line starts with the word give, except for the fourth one, which has a comparable verb, uh, worship. So listen to those verses now, and specifically in your mind, think of them as four lines rather than two verses. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. See how distinctly they form these four lines. Well, obviously, the first three lines go together in a different way than they go with the fourth line. So the first three lines are similar in that they all begin with the phrase, Give unto the Lord. Exactly the same expression, repeated twice. And this threefold uh, use of the phrase in, in the Hebrew manner of thinking and in Hebrew literature uh, suggests the greatest intensity. And we have different ways of showing intensity in modern English and typography. You know, we use all capital letters in an email or we boldface points in a presentation on paper, something like that. Or we underscore words. But none of those um, methods were available to the Jewish writers. So it was customary, and you can see many hundreds of examples of this in the Old Testament. Customary when emphasis was intended to use repetition. And even a single repetition was a point of emphasis. But when you see a threefold statement like this, it is intense emphasis. This give unto the Lord then is seen to be a, a, a duty of the highest uh, importance. It is telling us that uh, there is to be no higher priority for, for us and for our lives than what we are commanded to do here. To whatever it means, we must make sure that we are giving to the Lord uh, His glory. Um, now, the ones addressed in the psalm specifically are, are I believe, angels. Uh, they are designated by the phrase, O ye mighty, in the first line, or literally, sons of might. And... Uh, this is not also not unique or unusual that the angels might be addressed as the attendants to God in the heavenly court. Um, I could show you a number of passages where this idea is uh, found in the Old Testament especially. The, the, the conception is that the, the, the ultimate temple of the Lord is His, is his throne in, in heaven up above and he is surrounded by a vast retinue of, of mighty angelic servants who are, who are praising him and, and waiting to do his bidding at the slightest indication of it. 
And these are the, the creatures that are exhorted here when it says, O ye mighty, that is, you mighty angels, the ones nearest to God. The ESV renders the phrase, O heavenly beings, with, I think, justification. Now, they are mighty angels, and uh, one angel is far mightier than even a large army of human soldiers. But in comparison with omnipotence, they are nothing. And they derive their strength from the Almighty. And so they are, they are called upon to, to give to the Lord strength and glory. Line two. Uh, that is to admit, acknowledge that all the glory and strength that is seen in them is only God's own glory that comes down to them from God the source. Um, giving glory and strength to God is actually figurative language. Um, it means more literally to ascribe glory and strength to God, which is his inherently by virtue of his very being. God is glorious. God is strong, omnipotent. And so to give him glory and strength isn't to actually take some glory and take some strength and hand it over to him so he has more glory and strength than he had before. That's impossible. God only gives to the creatures. The creatures don't truly and literally give anything to God since everything belongs to him already. You know, there, there is the, um, the sentiment in Christian poetry, we give thee but thine own. Uh, rather, this idea of giving glory and strength to God is figurative and it means to praise him. Praise him for his glory. Praise him for his strength. Praise like this is rightly given to God because of uh, His very being. It says in the third line, this is 2a, verse 2a, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. His name is the same thing as saying Him. Give Him the glory that He deserves for who He is. He is infinitely praiseworthy. He is the one above all others that richly deserves to be praised. And so it is right and fitting that the most, the most mighty, most glorious creatures should turn our gaze away from them toward the one who is the altogether glorious, omnipotent God. That's what the psalm calls on the angels to do. And of course, that has implications for us. If the very angels in heaven have no boast of themselves, but redirect any attention to the Lord for his glory, then of course, lowly human beings like us ought to follow suit. Um, now we come uh, after this intense exhortation to glorify God by ascribing glory and strength to him. We come to the fourth line, the end of verse 2, which says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The word worship in the Hebrew literally means bow down. And the, the, the original language of the rest of verse 2 is apparently somewhat obscure and difficult to translate. The King James <clears throat> translators have made a decision to, to give it as Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The idea isn't that we are beautiful in holiness and that's the fitting way to worship God. Rather, it's worship the Lord himself who is him. He is beautiful in his holiness. Uh, but it could be translated in different ways. Um, one renders it in the splendor of his holiness, which is very close. Uh, it makes it plain it's God's holiness in view, not anything in us. God's holiness is fundamentally his set apartness. So the angels are called to 
ascribe glory and strength and praise to the Almighty um, because He is He is God alone. The Lord is absolutely unique. There is no one else comparable to Him. Neither so-called God nor creature is on the same level of existence even, in the same category as God Himself is, not even the highest angels. And uh, God's holy angels, of course, obey this call to worship, according to the biblical testimony. So they bow down and so ascribe to him uh, as Psalm 29 commands. You remember uh, Isaiah's testimony when he was in the spirit and God gave him a vision of the heavenly court. And he says in chapter 6, uh, what he saw, and it was this. One seraph cried to another seraph and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's obedience to the exhortation of Psalm 29. And Revelation 4.8 is a New Testament counterpart where the Apostle John, not Isaiah, also received a vision in the Spirit of heaven, and he he wrote what he saw. Um, the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And saints, that is, holy people on earth, join in with the angels in so praising the true and living God. Exodus chapter 15 verse 11 is an example where Moses sang, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, Doing wonders. And of course, these are rhetorical questions. The answer obviously would be, No one is like you, Lord. No one among the gods worshipped by the heathen. None of their gods are comparable to our God, the true and living one. And Revelation 15 testifies that there are human beings in, in heaven now that are so praising the Lord. Romans 15, verses 3 and 4. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So we, we are called by the psalm to participate with the saints in heaven and the angels um, in their praise of the one true and living God. And we do participate with them by singing Psalm 29, praying Psalm 29, and preaching Psalm 29. I wonder if you, you often call to mind what a glorious and supernatural thing it is to worship God in concert with other Christians in the, in the setting of the local church. This, this is not... The church meetings and, this, and especially worship services are not comparable to pep rallies or um, AA Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Or, uh, you know, certainly not concerts. If you go to some churches, you'd think you were at some kind of a musical concert, not here. But um, what actually happens in true Christian worship when churches assemble is that it's, it's like heaven descends to earth and we are participating in the sacred service 
of the mightiest holy angels and the saints in glory. That's what we're doing. We're doing the same thing that they do constantly when we worship the Lord from the heart. And that's why it's unthinkable not to attend unless you're providentially hindered. Amen? Amen. It's, it's supernatural. What happens in all Christ churches in true worship is a supernatural thing. Well, that's the call to worship in verses 1 and 2. Call to worship the sovereign Lord. And that sovereignty is elaborated in the next three sections. The Lord is majestic in power. He is majestic in position. He's majestic in his purpose. Um, the next section has to do with the Lord's majestic power. And the word majesty appears in verse 4. Uh, we read, The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And I think that that word majesty is the one better than any other that characterizes the whole psalm, you know, besides the name of the Lord himself. The word majesty. In English, it has a, the word majesty has a, a heritage, a lineage that gets traced back for centuries out of the Latin. Uh, the original sense in Latin meant greatness, dignity, elevation, honor, and excellence. And the evidence is that when human beings first started using an early form of this word that we now know as majesty, it was used exclusively with reference to God. Whatever majesty meant, it was associated with God. And it was only in the late 14th century that the term majesty came to refer to kings and queens. Um, and so the, the order is this. God is not majestic because he is like a king. Rather, kings have majesty because in some small way they resemble God. The majesty of God is first. God is the one above all creatures who is exalted in his power. And when an earthly king takes charge of a kingdom and wields his scepter powerfully in that respect particularly he resembles in a faint way uh, the the god who made us and so here we're called to worship the lord with special uh remembrance of his his power in verses three to nine now there sometimes Certain aspects of preaching is like like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, that's the expression. You know what that means? Shooting fish in a barrel. If you wanted some fish for dinner and you had a shotgun and there were a bunch of fish in a barrel full of water, all you'd have to do is point your gun down into the barrel and shoot it and you'd kill some of the fish and they'd float to the top and there you'd have dinner. It's easy, in other words. Anybody can do it. There are certain things about preaching that are like that. Because you, you, you're responsible as a preacher to point out sometimes the obvious. So let me point out the obvious to you in verses 3 to 9. What do you notice about verses 3 to 9 that is unusual or distinctive? What, what is, there, what is the, a feature of this passage that you don't find really like this anywhere else in all the Bible? Well, maybe some are just shy, but I'll point it out to you. It is the sevenfold repetition of the phrase, the voice of the Lord. Do you see it now that I'm pointing it out to you? In verse 3a, 4a, 4b, 5a, 7, 8a, and 9a. Seven times, the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord makes the hinds to calve. 
Now, I was curious about this notion of the voice of the Lord and how it appears in other places of Scripture. And I learned by study that uh, usually when the voice of the Lord is mentioned in the Scriptures, it has to do with His expressed will for others to obey. And very often when you read this phrase, the voice of the Lord in other passages, it is part of an indictment that sinful people have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. They have sinned by refusing to do what God commanded. For example, 2 Kings 18.12. 2 Kings 18.12 says, Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed His covenant, and all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, and would not hear them nor do them. So the voice of the Lord in that kind of a context means God's commandments, His revealed will in Scripture. And people sin by not obeying His commands. That is to not listen to uh, effectively the voice of the Lord. But here it's very different. In Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is not the Ten Commandments or any other moral precepts that we might find, but rather His voice is figurative for His effectual will. The voice of the Lord, if you will, is the evidence of His presence and His wish that a certain thing should happen. So when the Lord speaks, it is done always in the way the phrase the voice of the Lord is used here in the 29th Psalm. And here's the, here's the, the, the idea behind this. The greatness of an earthly king is seen in how far his expressed desire is carried out. Okay, so if a man is thinks he's king, and he tells certain people he regards as his servants to go do this, and they laugh in his face, and they get away with that, he's not a very great king. But the great king, the one that is to be the most feared and the most respected, is the one who commands uh, vast numbers of great ones, and his wish is carried out. There's a connection, in other words, between what he says and what happens. And so the king of Babylon, at his at his the peak of his his influence, was like this. He he was had a worldwide reputation for being uh, someone you don't cross, and he had men's lives and deaths in his hands. Um, well, here. When it comes to Jehovah, the greatest king's spoken wish is an inviolable decree. Uh, it is true, ultimately, only of God uh, that the king is law. Uh, there's an old Latin phrase for that that's easy to remember. It's rex lex. The king is law. That is, whatever it pleases the Almighty to, to do it is as good as done, just because he wishes it. I'm afraid that many Christians have crude notions of God that are not justifiable from Holy Scripture. Um, we, we have a tendency, I believe, to think, of, think that God is somewhat like we are. And to separate two things. God's purpose from his act. But both God's purpose and his acts are eternal. God doesn't need to conceive of a thing that he wishes to be done, will it to be done, and then do something else after that in order for it to be done. In God, his purpose, I'm talking about his sovereign decree, is eternal and effectual. So, it's, it's even figurative to say the voice of the Lord accomplishes these things. 
It just stands for the Lord's omnipotence in action. You see, there is no separation between God's willing a thing to happen and God's making the thing happen. If he wills it to happen, it's as good as done just by his willing it. And his will is eternal and unchanging. But that is so incomprehensible to us, really, finally, that the scriptures condescend to our level of understanding and and instead represents it this way. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. So we can see figuratively of the Lord speaking and then as a consequence of his speaking, things happen. It's a condescension really to the uh, metaphysical reality of God and his will. Creation actually instantly obeys God's will and his word, even the mightiest creatures. Uh, If you've never read A.W. Pink and his classic book, The Sovereignty of God, I don't know anywhere that that elaborates this more effectively in, in rhetoric than Pink did in the book. But he rehearses many scriptural verses that show how obedient the creatures are to God's wishes. Uh, and, and here we see that the Lord speaks and it is done in every realm. The Lord is over all the vast oceans. You see in verse 3, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon many waters. This is, this is a poetic way of saying God reigns as king over the seas of the world, the oceans. He is over them and they do his bidding. Um, and in the ancient world particularly, when there was superstition and fear of the oceans, uh, even sometimes in some nations, the oceans were worshipped as if they, they in themselves were gods. Uh, the psalmist is saying the God of Israel, Jehovah, he rules over the vast oceans and the, and the thunder of the heavens. He is seated as th- on the throne as, as the sovereign Lord over these mighty creatures which are regarded as gods in their own right by many. But the Lord of Israel is over them and they are his obedient servants. God commands the thunderstorms at sea. That's what verse 3 has to do with. God also at his whim breaks the largest cedar trees mentioned in verse 5. In fact, no matter how big round they are and how tall they are, if the Lord wishes them broken, they snap like toothpicks and dance in the forest. And I could just, I don't know exactly what was intended in verse 5 when it says, The Lord breaks the cedars and makes them skip like a calf. But what I envision is the Lord wishing that the mighty trees of the forest just break into little pieces and then the pieces are all just moving all about uh, like like dancing calves in a field. That's an illustration of the Lord's power. Uh, The Lord also is sovereign over... Uh, Mount Hermon, here referred to uh, by an unusual name, Sirion. You can see that Sirion is Mount Hermon in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 9. So, in every creaturely realm, God's mere wish, indicated by His voice, is done. Whether it has to do with fire, or the wilderness, or deer, all of them are under God's perfect control. Look at verse 7. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. And verse 9, the voice of the Lord makes the deer to give birth, is the idea. The hinds, that's another name for deer. To calve, that's an antiquarian word for giving birth to little little fawns. It's the Lord's wish that they should give birth like that. And because he wills it to happen, it happens. 
And uh, in verse 9, the Lord discovers the forests. That means He reveals them. But I think the ESV captures the thought well when it translates. He makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. Strips the forest bare. So these, these, are, these are some of the most... Um, seemingly uncontrollable elements of nature that are presented one after another, the oceans, the, the atmospheric heavens, uh, the creatures in the forests, the trees, the mountains, fire, and so forth. And all of these creatures are perfectly under God's constant control. And these are all evidences of the power of, and the majesty of the Lord Himself. Verse 4. So verse 4 is a little, little bit different from the other verses in this section because instead of illustrating the Lord's powerful uh, word, it tells us abstractly about the Lord's uh, will being mighty. And it calls, calls the Lord's voice powerful and full of majesty. And... Uh, and so we get the idea, this is not obscure, it's easy to understand what's intended here. The Lord is the sovereign king over his whole creation, and what he wants to happen, happens. I wish all professing Christians really got that. It seems like there are real mental reservations that many Christians have about God's absolute sovereignty. When it comes especially to the free moral acts of human beings, they want to imagine that God's sovereignty somehow stops at that border and the heart of man is beyond the reach of God's control, but Scripture testifies explicitly otherwise. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hand. He turns it any way he wishes, like the rivers of water. And brethren, if the king's heart is turned this way and that by the sovereignty of God, the king, the mightiest human in the world, well, so are the, the ones under the king whether they are lords or uh, maids or lowly uh, servants, slaves. They're all in the Lord's hand. Now, uh, Douglas Kelly is a very uh, reputable reform scholar. I love his books. Uh, after reviewing nine different words in Scripture that convey some nuance of the term majesty, seven in the Old Testament and two in the New Testament, he wrote this, in summary, the majesty of God involves the vastness of his being, infinite, sovereign power, outraged splendor. That's an unusual word, outraged splendor, that is shining outwardly. And glory, absolute perfection of beauty in his triune personhood, and perhaps to our surprise, that surpassingly wondrous beauty is especially found in the self-sacrificial divine love. He means, of course, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the church. This is where the majesty and the glory of God is seen supremely. Now, as I've been talking about how about God's effectual power that His will is instantly done... Uh, you know, without any resistance from the creatures, some of you might be thinking, well, what about what you admitted before that God commands and people don't obey the voice of the Lord? Well, think about how outrageous that is. While all other creatures are obedient to God, fallen angels and men dare to disobey this great and sovereign Lord. And our sin testifies to our utter perversity as creatures. You know, especially when we're in our unconverted state, the Bible characterizes sinners as those with no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. Romans chapter 3, verse 18. That is the height of insanity. That is uh, supremely ruinous to the person who suffers it. No fear of God before their eyes. Oh yes, the oceans 
and the clouds and the mountains and the fire and the wilderness and all the forest animals snap to God's will and do exactly what God commands them to do. But the sinners don't. And yet, even sinners in their sins are not able to withstand God's continuous control over them. There is a sense in which even when we are sinning, we are carrying out God's, God's will and purpose. You doubt me on this? Look at Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6. Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. He said, this is Jehoshaphat, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And what are, what are the kingdoms of the heathen but conspiracies of unbelief against God and rebellion against God? And yet, Israel's king says, Jehovah rules over the kingdoms of the rebellious ones. And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Uh, you know, in other words, even the kingdoms of the heathen are not able to withstand the sovereign purpose of God. So unwittingly, they are subject to God's sovereign pleasure and will, just like the forest and the deer and the oceans and everything is. That's an astounding truth to, to consider. But, but the most amazing display of God's power is His saving power. His power that turns sinners, rebellious sinners, into religious saints. And maybe that's at least hinted at in the end of verse 9. This is the end of the second section on the Lord's majestic power. The, the third line of the verse 9 says, And in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. Now, scholars debate whether what this means, whether it's referring to the temple in heaven, uh, where the sons of the mighty, the angels are, the, the ones first addressed in the beginning of the psalm, or whether this is talking about the Jerusalem temple and the psalm was written for worshipers in that temple and they could sing this to the Lord and in so doing they would be speaking of the Lord's glory as it says here in verse 9. Uh, I think it's probably the former that the first temple in view is the heavenly temple with the angels. But even if temple in verse 9 refers to heaven, it certainly has its counterpart on earth. So that the Old Testament temple was meant as a symbol of the spiritual heavenly reality. And the Old Testament temple was pointing forward typologically to the church of the New Testament where those who were formerly enemies of God willingly, cheerfully gather to ascribe glory and strength to this, the only true God. And, and why is it that people are saved and join in the praises of Jesus Christ, even in this life? It's because the gracious and almighty power of God is already at work to change them. God is already set about His redemptive plan to recreate the fallen creation so that it will finally be better than the beginning. Do you understand this? This is what's in view in 2 Corinthians 5.17 when Paul wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creature. It's, it's very staccato and, and succinct in the Greek. I know the translation says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's more flowing than the original. 
If any man or anyone is in Christ, new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. In other words, in the conversion of sinners to be Christians in this life, you are witnessing God at work in a redemptive way in advance of the cosmic redemption that will be effected when Jesus Christ returns from heaven to earth. In other, here's another way to put it. The Lord Jesus, from His throne on heaven, by sending the Spirit, is renewing the souls of men, preparing us early to take our part as obedient worshipers in the new creation. Glory has broken in upon this sin-cursed fallen world and the evidence is the church on earth. So our true worship is evidence of God's power already redeeming His creation. Well, that is the second part of the psalm, the Lord's majestic power. Now consider very briefly the third part, the Lord's majestic position, which is verse 10. The text says, in the King James Version, the Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth as king forever. Now it should be obvious that the sitting involved here is not resting. The sitting is regal. Because it says, he sits as king forever. And where is it that kings take their seat? On a throne. That is a peculiarly kingly place. And when the king sits upon his throne, that is symbolic of his kingliness. And that's what's in view here. The Lord is enthroned. Even the ESV uses the word enthroned twice in this verse. And what the verse is is telling us is that the Lord's enthronement is eternal and unshakable. It's the Lord, the Lord sits upon even the turbulent waters, the flood, as the sovereign king. And the Lord of Israel, Jehovah of Israel, is the, is the God who is sitting upon his throne as king forever and ever. And it shall always be. Of course, this is the grand theme of the Hallelujah chorus. And he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, All this is figurative imagery to convey the absolute sovereignty of God. And and I'm, I'm worried about people who say they believe in God, but the God they have in their minds is not a God who's absolutely sovereign. The reason I'm worried is that absolute sovereignty necessarily belongs to the true deity. God, by virtue of being God, must be necessarily and absolutely sovereign. Any supposed deity that's not sovereign, not absolutely sovereign over all creation, could not possibly be the true God of Holy Scripture, Jehovah. If anybody worships a God, therefore, which is not absolutely sovereign, they're committing idolatry. They're worshiping some creation, some fabrication perhaps of their own minds, and not the God that really is, because He is absolutely sovereign. The Lord sits forever upon His throne. That's the Lord's majestic position. And then finally, verse 11 The Lord's majestic purpose. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Now look, according to the doctrine of this psalm, saints praise God because he is sovereign, omnipotent, and eternal. But added to all this, we praise him because in his gracious love, he purposes to save us. And this adds great joy to our praises. This sovereign Lord is the one who purposes, and therefore it shall come to pass, to give strength to his people, to bless his people with peace. That is, 
in his gracious love, he purposes to save his chosen people. The phrase his people is particular. In the historic psalm, it refers to the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, spiritual understanding, it is, of course, a reference to the church. It's not referring to all people without exception, but to those who are worshipers of Jehovah. And then um, to give strength to his people means to give us victory over our enemies. And uh, the Christian has many enemies. The church of Jesus Christ has many enemies. But we shall prevail by the grace of the sovereign Lord because he gives us strength and gives us victory. Seven times in the seven letters to the churches, Revelation 2 and 3, we read of, of the blessings of eternal life which are promised to the ones who are called overcomers. To the one who overcomes, I will give the fountain of the water of life and other aspects of eternal life. It's the, it's the winners that are saved. The triumphant ones that are saved. The ones who persevere and struggle and fight and win in our spiritual warfare by the grace and power of God. We are the ones uh, that the Lord promises to bless with peace. And the blessing of peace is a great one. You know what peace means? No more enemies. It means the enemies are vanquished. No more warfare. Everybody in God's kingdom is, is together on one side. There's no longer two sides in the kingdom of God. That reality is coming to pass. And it too is God's gift. Because our God is so majestic, we can celebrate in advance the certain outcome of our salvation and praise Him who saves us. This is, I believe, the basic message of Psalm 29, and it is a most encouraging one. Oh, worship the King. Uh, he is the Sovereign Lord. He is majestic in power, position, and purpose. And uh, therefore, we praise Him. Amen. I cannot believe 57 minutes have passed since I started.